Good afternoon, everybody. Could you um, file in? I realize it's standing room only. Apologies for underestimating the crowd. Uh, we're going to start just because time is so tight given the J term. My name is Mindy Roseman. I will sit. I'm the academic director of the Human Rights Program. We are very, very happy to welcome our two speakers. I know you turned out for Professor Alex Whiting, who unfortunately is not able to moderate. So, um, Professor uh, Louis Moreno Ocampo and Tim McCormick will self introduce and they will self moderate. Um, and I will turn it over to them now. Thank you very much. See, it's, it's a real shame that Professor Whiting can't be with us. He's a dear friend and colleague of both of us, uh, having worked at the International Criminal Court with him. But uh, he, has, he has much more important responsibilities with a, a sick mum, so I hope it goes well for him. Uh, I'm Tim McCormack, and I'm here teaching in the winter term international criminal law, and uh, I'm very pleased to see almost all my students here. I'm also very pleased to welcome uh, Mr Ocampo's students from Kennedy School of Government. Thanks for coming across. And we're looking forward to having a chat about the International Criminal Court. Uh, let me just say a few things about uh, Mr Ocampo by way of introduction. He uh, cut his teeth, we would say, colloquially in Australia. Uh, in terms of his prosecution experience in Argentina, prosecuting uh, military, senior military officers after the dirty war there. And it was on the basis of that experience in particular that he was elected uh, to be appointed the inaugural prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. He was sworn into office in The Hague in March 2003 and served throughout that fundamental phase of the establishment of the court right through until 2012. In uh, 2010, he made the outstanding decision to look outside of the United States of America for special advisors and appointed me his special advisor on war crimes. And uh, I've continued to serve in that capacity, not only for the rest of his tenure, but also through the tenure of his successor, um, Madam Fatou Ben Souda from the Gambia. So really, it's really great to have uh, Mr Ocampo here on campus and we're looking forward to talking together about some of the challenges facing the International Criminal Court. Please, Lewis. Okay. Uh, yes. It's a great honour for me to be with Tim McCormack, uh, who I think is a global expert on international material law. I had the privilege to work for nine years as the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. I arrived to The Hague on June 2003. Six floors were empty, two employees, and 18 judges waiting for a case. And the world thinking, the, world thinking the, the court would be closed. Um, nine years later, when I left, the court was fully operational. We had many different cases, including relation with Security Council, who was absolutely impossible to foresaw when we started. So the court in 2012 was another international institution, fully equipped, fully working. So the next challenge is about relevance. When I took office, the challenge was about existence. The challenge now is about relevance. And I'm very glad to be with Tim here, because I believe you can discuss many aspects of the International Criminal Court. There are different issues, many, many issues. But I'd like to focus on one issue that I think is a critical issue. And I'd like to do it because we're at Harvard. So the future world leaders are coming from here. Also, many of you will be world leaders. And I believe we need the world leaders to improve things in the 21st century. Uh, the abnormally when you prepare very well a PowerPoint, something happens that you cannot expose it. So I prepare my PowerPoint. <laughs> um, and the issue I'd like to discuss with you is the 21st century dilemma is, are we managing violence in the world as a war on terror? 
or as the global justice. That, I think, is a crucial discussion in the 21st century. And as you see, it's a piece of that discussion. It's not everything. It's a piece of the discussion. And that's the point I like to present. I like to... I have a video. The, I, I, can, I can say the story, but the video... I, I like to show the video because the video presents question 13. So, in 2001, so 21st century, 2001, September 11, the same day of September 11, President Bush decided that it's no more a law enforcement activity. Now it's a war on terror. So he transformed the framework. He said, okay, we are going to war with these groups. And it's, the issue is not something light, it's heavy, because the U.S. decided to go to war against non-state actors. And that has a huge legal implications. Two years later, I was appointed as a prosecutor, and I was thinking, okay, I, I'm quoting myself, but I like my quote. <laughs> the, the, the quote says, my, my, the end of my swinging speech was, we must learn there is no safe heaven for life and freedom if we fail to protect the rights of any person in any country of the world. Because I was quoting the, you know, I said, look, even the biggest country in the world, that the U.S., could not protect its own people in the September 11 case. Or I was quoting an incident in my country, um, in my case in Argentina, when I prosecuted the case in Argentina, uh, one of the cases were the daughters of the woman who lost her parents in Auschwitz. So because she lost her parents in Auschwitz, she escaped from Europe and came to Argentina to be, live a peaceful life. Her daughter was execu executed, abducted and executed by the Argentine dictatorship. So the only way to live well is to, if we can organize a very balanced world where balance is control. But we're not yet there, no? And, and that, I think, is part of the lack of a global design. We have this war on terror, and at the same time we have the ICC coming. And both are in parallel. And I have a question. Uh, so I would like to start with the war on terror, what I see as a problem. And to support me, I have a video that you can to try to see, because it's a video, interesting video of... Um, showing an operation in Iraq on 12th of July, 2007. It was an Apache helicopter uh, monitoring and shooting in Baghdad a group of people that the uh, Apache, the, the, the pilot and the, 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 the troops in the Apache helicopter were considering enemy combatants. And they shoot them. And I like if Tim can comment on this legality or that, but I believe, even if some aspects are, you can discuss, I don't think you can prosecute or convict these individuals. I will show a scene where there is a person they shoot, and there was a journalist who was a mistake they did. They shoot a journalist who was not an enemy combatant, and the guy is on the ground, and the helicopter people say, take the weapon. Take the weapon and we shoot you. So that's the meaning is they were following rules. They were not killing people by, because they want to kill people. They were just following rules and they were thinking they were shooting what they should shoot. And I like, I like Tim commenting on that, on the legality of that. But then I like you thinking, okay, even if it's legal, is it the right policy? That is for me the question. I'd like to present first. And then we discuss the alternative, how we can establish a global legal system. But first, start, I'd like to start with the war on terror and some of the problems I see with the war on terror. So let me see if this, how this works. Not well enough for everyone to see it, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. And this is the video that Manning allegedly leaked is a, it's a an video, video registration of an attack by Manning. an American Apache helicopter hovering high above Baghdad early in the morning of the 12th of July 2007, opening fire on a group of men walking on this square.
Okay. You saw? All right. So. If these images had not. They were. The, this helicopter shooting this group of eight persons. And one of the reasons is one of them hi, have a, a weapon who is normally prohibited. And so the first question to Tim is, can a person who has this kind of pro grenade, grenade propeller be shooting? Is it became a legitimate target? That's the first question. Yeah, so I looked at the uh, I looked at the video last night with uh, Mr. Ocampo. We were having a bit of a chat about today, and he asked me, "Is it a war crime?" And I said to him, "I would never say unequivocally that um, from a video footage like that it was a war crime or it wasn't a war crime because there's a whole lot of questions that need to be asked about it. But the the specific question about a person carrying a rocket propelled grenade down the street of Iraq, where hostilities are being conducted." under international humanitarian law is either a combatant or a civilian taking a direct part in hostilities and therefore is a legitimate a military target. There's an altogether separate question about whether everyone within the vicinity of that person is also legitimately targetable. And there were, seemed to me, a couple of different groups of people. One group was a few metres ahead of these guys walking down the street with a rocket propelled grenade. <laughs> And uh, I said to him, I'd be very concerned if rules of engagement and orders for opening fire allowed you to assume that anybody who was in close physical proximity to the person carrying the weapon was also taking a direct part in hostilities if they were civilians or were a member of a combatant group when they are wearing nothing to indicate that they are. So there's all sorts of questions that need to be asked. Uh, fortunately, the guy who is the subject of the discussion in the cockpit of the Apache about just pick up a weapon and we'll shoot you. This is all conversation between the pilot and whoever else is is uh, is making the decision about opening fire. The guy who's wounded on the street doesn't pick up a weapon and it turns out that was the journalist who was wrongly wrongly shot. But, yeah, I, I mean, trying to sort of make a determination of what's criminal and what isn't criminal conduct solely on the basis of that is it's not the, ba it's not the way to go. No, but just the person who got a properly grenade could be a target. Yeah. So if you got some kind of weapons, you became a target, and a legitimate target. The next question is, if you are with a person who has a weapon, can you then be a target or not? Can you be considered part of the, of the combatant group? That's a different question. No? Yeah. And then, yes, I have this. I don't know how this system is. I know, wait, wait. This one, I like to show this one. I like to show this. Well, we this guy crawling on the floor. So the guy is saying, take the weapon, then they can fire. Because the rule is, if you are, even if you are a combatant, they consider him a combatant, no? But they say it's a combatant who is wounded and with no weapon you cannot fire him no yeah that's a rule so they were right on this well they might not have decided he was a combatant they might have decided he was a civilian taking a direct part in hostilities we're talking about two different categories anyway. okay so they either could, way they could consider a civilian taking part in hostilities yeah but in any that's, case that's if, he's, if he's wounded so can you explain the difference between both i can try to D do it <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, we, we distinguish in international humanitarian law between combatants and civilians, and uh, it's prohibited to attack civilians. They are immune from attack, but they forfeit that immunity as soon as they take a direct part in hostilities. And there's a formula in the, in the, in the treaty law, and that's been interpreted and applied in, in different contexts, and in this one in particular, and also in Afghanistan and other situations where the enemy fighting force does not wear military uniform to distinguish themselves from the civilian population. It's actually very difficult to work out, is someone an enemy combatant or are they a civilian taking direct part in hostilities? For the purposes of targeting, uh, and by targeting I mean the use of lethal military force, you don't have to distinguish between those two. You have to distinguish between both of those categories and the civilian population who are not taking direct part yeah. in hostilities. 
So when they shoot him, they consider him a civilian who was taking part in the Well, I'm not sure. Well, probably. Yeah, probably. Because they, they did not shoot him when he had no more weapons. <coughs> That's right. Good so call. for me, it's interesting because the quote is showing these guys were not criminals. They were soldiers following rules, strictly following rules. And when they saw this man that they believe in some way or is a civilian who is part, taking part in hostility or is a combatant, but with no weapons, they did not shoot him. Okay? So they had no criminal intentions in this sense. And then what happened next is, um, is, is a man who, who came in, in his own car who saw the guy on the ground and tried to help. But the helicopter people believe these guys are coming to recover weapons and bodies. And that also is, is possible. You see this guy coming, and maybe it's someone who's connected with the group who's coming to rescue the guy who's wounded and recover the, the weapons. And in fact, it was a man with his two children who was passing for them. But the helicopter people did not see them. So the next thing they do is they request permit to engage. They say they are taking him. So they are requesting permission to engage against this car coming to rescue this person who probably is a combatant or, or a civilian part, taking part in the facilities. So they engage. They, whoever was the big thing. They decided thing. to engage the van, engage the people, and completely obliterate it. Okay. So whoever was the victim, as soon as they request permission to engage and they receive instruction to engage, can can they be prosecuted or? Uh, not on the basis of that. For vi no. video footage alone, no. I mean, the only way you could be certain that it was criminal conduct is if the um, <clears throat> is if the decision maker in the Apache knows that that is a civilian with two kids in the car. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's it's not it's a, a mistake. It's a mistake. That's my point. It was not a crime. It was a mistake. Honest mistake. The guy <laughs> did not try to kill. The father, the, he was thinking this guy was kind of coming to rescue another member of the group, civilian involved in hostilities or a combatant. And then the last part of the video you barely saw is when the infantry came crime. and they came to see what Not happened crime. there. Not cries and then the guy now Got talking a is a soldier who came in a tank man. and went to see the car. And he found the car were the kids, not I just... I saw that there was a minivan and the cries appeared to be coming from it. Myself and another soldier, a 20-year-old private, walked up to the passenger side van and looked inside. The private that I was with reeled back, began to vomit, and quickly ran away. Right here. That's you. Right here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you and I go in and I grabbed the girl. You open the door. What I saw when I looked in the van was a small girl about four years old on the passenger side of the bench seat. She had a severe belly wound and was covered in glass. The glass was in her hair and also in her eyes. Next to her, half on the floorboard, with his head resting on the seat, was a boy about seven years old. He wasn't moving and from the severe wound to the right side of his head, my first thought was that he was dead. In the driver's seat was who I immediately concluded must have been these children's father by the way he was hunched over the children in a protective manner. There was no way that the father had survived.
The, the Apache people say it's their fault for taking their kids to the battle. And after the soldiers say, it's not that they take the kids on the battle. We put our war into their garden. And that is for me the policy, the policy issue. No? This, this documentary ends with the family of this man who was killed. The two, the, the boy and the girl survived it. The, bo the boy and the girl survived it, and they are alive. The mother is a widow, and the, and the brother of the mother is there. This is the kid who survived, and this is the sister, both survived, okay? And this is the widow, and then you have the brother of the victim. And the brothers say the following, the only thing will be comfort me is if I met an American, I kill him, and I drink his blood. And that is for me the question, because as, as Tim say, I don't think these soldiers commit a crime, or could be prosecuted, or could be convicted for a crime. Because you, when you listen, there's nothing they were trying to kill people. They were just trying to follow the rules. So legally, could be fine. What I say, the war on terror is failing because is, is alienating people. Politically is wrong. The consequences are wrong. So U.S. intervened in Iraq to rescue these people from Saddam Hussein dictatorship. But now these people is say, are saying they want to, to kill Americans and drink their blood. So is something wrong in the policy, no? What do you think? <laughs> I'd like to know what role you would see for the International Criminal Court in a different approach. If it's uh, war on terror versus global justice is how you sort of set up the, the dichotomy earlier on. If the policy is wrong, in, what's, the, what's the alternative approach and what's the role of the International Criminal Court in it, do you think? Yeah, I think... That's so answering a question with a question. No, I thought that. Very good. <laughs> I think this, uh, the, the issue for me is, are we fighting a war against enemies or are we trying to control criminals? These are two different frames. And that's why for me, yes, ICC is providing a different frame who could work. And in fact, it's working. I have a, a new map. I can show you, show you that you have a problem. Okay, first... This is a graph that you really barely can see now, done by Catherine Sicking. She did a quantitative analysis showing there's a growing trend to request accountability and to establish accountability for our leaders. Okay? Starting at Nuremberg at international level, but then following the national system in Greece, Portugal, and Argentina in 1985. And then keep moving. You have ICDY, Rwanda Tribunal, and then ICC. So that is the new, the new world, and Catherine is showing with quantitative analysis that this is a trend with well-established going up. And I believe it's showing a norm that people that not accept abuse of power, people that not accept that someone who has power can abuse of it killing people. Being in particular head of states cannot do that, but also terrorists cannot do that. So I believe that's a norm. And then I believe we should take advantage of it. So for me, what is missing in the world today is policy leaders understanding this new demand and adjusting institutions to deal with that. And in fact, the, the only case they did it is ICC. Uh, I have some videos I will not show you. <laughs> oh. But I'd like to show this map. If you like to understand ICC, you have to understand this map. 
This map so show in blue countries who are ratified the treaty. So they are members of the ICC. So these countries, as a matter of law, define it that they will prevent and punish massive atrocities, and they reduce their own sovereignty to increase their efficiency, establishing an international criminal court that they accepted could interfere in their own cases. So it could, could, inter, could intervene in their own territory if the country is not conducting genuine proceedings. So that is a new concept. It's the confederation of states connected with a very tiny issue on preventing mass atrocities based on national system, but using as a default system, as a backup system, an ICC system. And in this sense, they create a confederation. And it's funny, because this idea of a confederation preventing atrocities connected with the international court, you know who presented it? Who knows who presented this idea? I know, someone has just been... No. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, in 1909, received the Nobel Prize. He said that. He said... The peace will be possible if we create a confederation of states committed to maintain peace, and we have an independent court helping the states to solve problems in the way we do it in the U.S., when you have the, national, the states and you have the Supreme Court helping us to play together. So that the view of U.S. Theodore Roosevelt in beginning of 20th century. And in some way, I see... Is, is that, because this idea became for the first time at Nuremberg possible, because Nuremberg, I don't know if you understand how remarkable it was Nuremberg, because until Nuremberg, prosecutors represent a national state. Prosecutors represent, or a, or, a, or a country, or a city, or a state, Boston, Massachusetts, US, Australia, Argentina, not, nothing else. The, the prosecutor, criminal law was like a currency and the flag, the, the, the main core of the nationality, of sovereignty. However, in 1945, because of the Nazi crimes, the world adopted a new concept. International community could make individual responsibility. And that was new. How, who knows how many times international criminal justice was mentioned in the UN Charter? More than three times? More than one time? Zero. The answer is zero. International criminal justice was not part of the design of the UN. In, that, in this sense, that's why what we see is, is it's happening with no designers. Well, that's why we need Harvard designers, Harvard law students, designing this thing, because it's not working perfectly, but it's moving. So 1945, no design, but it was established. Robert Jackson, the Supreme Court Justice and former Attorney General, was the prosecutor of Nuremberg, and he explained so well the meaning of that. But the Cold War made this idea disappear. The Cold War was not about rules. The Cold War was about friends or enemies. The end of the Cold War allowed us to go back. Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia Tribunal. It's interesting because Yugoslavia was created just for hypocrisy reasons, for hypocritical reasons, because just Europe was ashamed that what happened in the Balkans, and they saw pictures of people very in similar situations in, in, the, in the Nazi concentration camps. So they invented ICTY to do something. They were not funding ICTY, they were not supporting. However, and everyone was, <laughs> was uh, uh, forecasting that we'll this would be wrong, we'll do nothing. ICTY ended indicting 161 people. And you know how many fugitives? Zero. None. All of them were captured. No one would say that before. So, and then the next year was 94, Rwanda genocide. The court cannot ignore Rwanda genocide. And this evolution was, okay, we have Nuremberg against Nazi, everyone agree, but stop it. It was just against, against, against Nazis. Jackson could not prosecute Russian troops. Jackson could not prosecute American people. Just against Nazis. As the why again, as the why was just against people committing crimes in the Balkans. Rwanda was just crimes committed in Rwanda by Rwandese. Security Council excluded the possibility to investigate French people in Rwanda tribunal. So ICC is not the same. ICC is a huge jump, it's a huge leap forward, because meaning ICC is justice in impartial justice. So ICC was a permanent court dealing with anyone committing crimes. And so the blue countries accepted that. 
And that's why we are in a difficult world, because in the blue countries, they are promoting or supporting or accepting, <laughs> with hesitance sometimes, the, the idea of stop massive atrocities, no one can commit it, and we do justice. In the white countries, not. The white countries are still no rules. In the white countries, it's still political business. So basically, you have uh, two systems. We have these blue countries, it's a confederation state envisioned by Theodore Roosevelt. And you have the white countries with no rules. Here it's a matter of political decisions. So here you can do war on terror or whatever, it's fine. What, so whatever you decide would be, it's a political thing. There's no legal restrictions. And, and that's what I, when you tell me, ICC, we need to see how this blue system is working. That is for me the main issue, no? How the blue system is working. And for me the best example, and we discussed today in our class, is Colombia example. The best case in my tenure was Colombia, the case we never opened. Because the, the main idea is national court should have primacy, mm -hmm. and Colombia prosecute these people. And not just the pro Colombia prosecuting people, Colombia made a huge agreement in 2005, demobilizing 31,000 paramilitaries, but forcing 2,000 of them to go to jail to avoid the ICC. They went to jail for eight years. And now, Colombia is dealing with the FARC, the guerrilla, and they're making a deal with them, forcing the leaders of the guerrilla to, to, free to privacy of some freedoms for, nine year for eight years. So Colombia is not just prosecuting people. It's trying to prevent crimes, making negotiations, but negotiations that respect the legal framework. And that, for me, is a better example that you can see. Of course, outside the blue countries, it's a mess. How to deal with ISIS now is complicated. My suggestion is we need to do something different, because bombing ISIL will not solve the issue. Killing Islamic State people will not solve the issue, will not win the battle. Mm -hmm. President Biden say they, we, we are not killing fast enough because they are recruiting more people. And, uh, and at the same time, no, if you are a prosecutor and you deal ISIS and terror group for me are a different, group, a different kind of, organi of, of uh, organized crime. And to deal with organized crimes, basically, you're not just putting people in jail you think how to disrupt the criminal organization. <laughs> and that's what I'm missing in this war on terror. You are targeting people, killing people, but not disrupting the organization. Who is investigating the money? Why ISIL is selling oil? Who is buying the oil? Where is the money of ISIL coming from? from? What's the role of Turkey? So, because it's a, it's a the white countries are political scenarios, Political issues are more heavy on this issue. So that's why, yes, I believe the idea of, of internal justice should be discussed how to, uh, to create a strategy to deal with terrorism respecting rules, respecting law. I think it's uh, important to take a longer term perspective on progress because if we just think on yeah. the last five or ten years, there's all sorts of reasons for discouragement. But if we do go back to the turn of the 19th into the 20th century and think about what's been achieved in that period of time then it's clear that there are some significant advances and the ICC is a classic example of that. Uh, it's a very important advance over Nuremberg and Tokyo and over the ICTY and ICTR models that you've already identified. Uh, so I'm a big fan of it but uh, the challenges have to do with the white areas on the global map. I mean how is it possible as a matter of principle that the ICC has no jurisdiction over Syria and or, or over any of the other country situations that we know we are precluded from exercising jurisdiction over because of the limitations to the jurisdiction of the court? So while it's good to celebrate the advance that the ICC represents, it's clearly not representative of a global, systematic, comprehensive, impartial system of justice. We're still a long way away from that. So I guess for me, one of the big challenges for the ICC 
is uh, how do we advance what the limitations it's currently saddled with? How do we how do we even get the court into the situation where it deals with nationals of some of those white countries who allegedly perpetrate ICC crimes on the physical territory of some of the blue countries? That's that's an, a short term challenge for the court. A longer term one is how do we move beyond the current limitations that the court has to its jurisdiction so that it's able to exercise it more comprehensively. Do you have any, uh, yeah, any reactions to that? Yeah. Uh, you had to deal with the Security Council on a regular basis, so I don't. I had the pleasure, yeah. <laughs> okay, but that, I think one of the big, for me, the real challenge is not about prosecutors and judges. The real judge is about political leadership. Mm -hmm. For instance, we have a genocide in Darfur. Everyone in 2004, 5, everyone was worried about Darfur genocide. At Harvard was full of students making lobby on that. Now nothing happened. Mm. Because uh, Bashir was strong, Obama decided to use Darfur case to negotiate the South independence. And then Bashir was making a lot of pressure on African Union, and African Union there are five or six other leaders who should be in jail too. So it's difficult for the other African countries to compensate that. Today we have a Didier Trati with us, who was the legal advisor of the UN mission in New York, and now is a member of the International Law Commission. And he made an interesting point today. Yes, South Africa is committed with ICC, but we went to the African Union meetings, now we have a, a big effort of seven, ten countries against ICC. And yes, you don't like that, but you have, you have other issues in your agenda. So how ICC should be a priority or we should prioritize other issues we have? So that is, is a relevant question for me. So it's not about the judges, the prosecutors, how the states manage. Sure. Because that is for me the big... Is imagine in Boston, if we've got a tradition that, okay, different members of the city hall discuss if they accept investigation in their own neighborhood. Oh, no, in, the, in Back Bay, no. Back Bay, we don't like investigations. No, 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 no. So it's not about judge or prosecutor. It's about, guys, it's not possible. We have, people have, in Boston, people have consensus, should not be acceptable, and then all political leaders accept that. And that is obvious in Boston. It's not yet obvious in the world. Yeah, sure. And we are missing the point, because lawyers are analyzing courts in Boston, and the court in Boston has no problem with the police, has no problem with the, the, the politicians, because the community is different. And, but the ICC is, I was always thinking, where is my community? How to reach my community? It's complicated. Mm. Um, and where are my leaders? I remember, I remember the, the, the president of the European Parliament who told me, oh my God, you're a stateless prosecutor. Of course, I, am a stateless, I was a stateless prosecutor. And then you, where, I had to convince state to work with me. And it's complicated. So for me, the challenge is not for the court. The challenge is for the rest. The court is just the face of the system. But how to build the system is the issue. Mm. And that's why it's important to have Harvard students thinking on that issue. It's not just about one case on immunity. Or one case. There are different interesting cases to discuss. But we need to help to understand the, legal, the global legal design and see how we can fix it. I wonder if we should have a, just a quick chat about South Africa and Omar al Bashir while we're on the subject. Uh, so he's he's there. And, uh, <laughs> maybe you can comment on it. He's there, he's there visiting as part of an African Union meeting. The court. Uh, um, it's interesting because that's what he's showing. The real issue about the, for me is shocking because journalists asking me about the journal they never asked me about genocide in Darfur. They always ask me about African bias. And the African bias is a prejudice well organized by President Bashir to protect himself. Because there's no African bias that is the Africa. Most 70% of the cases in, in the Security Council are from Africa. The others, the others are from the Arab world. Because most of the Arab world is not part of the ICC. Our cases are in Africa. As in Nuremberg, the cases were in Germany. Mm. There was no a bias against Germany. No, the criminals were, were Germans. I'm sorry. And now the worst crimes plus no national investigations are in Africa and in Arab world. But of course, that is now creating Bashir move, and maybe it's my responsibility, is creating this difficult dynamic where a head of state has a lot of power and pushing, 
and it's a backlash. And it's interesting because South Africa in 2010 told President Bashir, don't come to, to the swinging of President Zuma because you, you could be arrested. Last year, they, South Africa reconsidered and accepted to come. Did it rather tell us a legal reason? The reason is they are thinking there is no immunity for head of state before the ICC. That's clear. Any head of state before the judge of the ICC cannot allege, oh, I have immunity. But they say this is not changing the immunity for national systems. So for South African national system, Bashir has immunity. That's why the government considered was not it's properly represented. <coughs> More? You can, can you improve? Yeah, well, so what I would say is, is um, as a matter of international law, so it's not a matter of national law, it's a matter of international law, you essentially have two conflicting obligations. You've got right, the duty to cooperate with the world set. The question of immunity that's provided for in Article 27 only deals with the relationship between the accused and the court. Sure. Right? So it doesn't affect any other relationship. The relationship between South Africa and any non-state party like the U.S., Russia, Sudan continues to be governed by the rules of custom international law. And those rules of custom international law say you may not exercise your authority over the head of state. So that's really sort of the the basic idea. Yeah, that's great. There is one other important difference between the other situations, that's the Zuma inauguration, the World Cup, and the death of Mandela, is that this was not a meeting that's out of your control, so it didn't invite him. And I, I guess that in terms of policy going forward, the position that was enunciated in 2009, 10, and so on, would continue to be enunciated. And that is that we will invite him and we'll tell him if you come to our thing, you will be arrested because we have this obligation. But it's slightly different if it's an AU meeting and somebody else is inviting him, organizing or territory. I guess so that's the political Yeah. Will the ILC clarify that, that sort of clash of responsibilities, or you don't need to because it's pretty clear already? Yeah, how is that? The clash of international legal obligations on one, for states' parties I'm talking about, for states' parties to the Rome Statute, you have an obligation to cooperate with the court, but you also ha- are bound by the rules of foreign state immunity in domestic courts. Yeah, I don't think they will clarify it because they made it very clear that the draft article that the ILC is working on is concerned only with the second part. Right. And so yeah. you'll only be looking at rules before the domestic courts. And they're pretty much, at least as far as the head of state are concerned, they've pretty much been clear for a long, t- for a long uh, time yeah. that the immunity is absolute. States, all states, have accepted that. Uh, not a single state raised issues and said, well, maybe we need to think about exceptions here. I think all states, they made comments about other things, but as far as head of state are concerned, yeah. so. Sure. Okay, we go to the to have questions, but before that, I'd like to make an exercise. In 2007, I received, when I, when I took office, I remember talking to my advisor in international relations and telling her, okay, the best will be start a case with a Security Council referral, because that will put together the global security system with the justice system. She told me, Luis, you are ignorant. You are zero possibility to receive a referral in your entire tenure, okay? Forget it. Bush was invading, intervening in Iraq, zero chance. She was right, I was wrong. However, two years later, that full referral came for many different reasons. And uh, some states were urging me to do the case immediately. I remember a conversation with the ambassador asking me three months after I received the referral, prosecutor, what is the case against Bashir? And I was shocked. I said, ambassador? Where are the evidence against Bashir? Two, three years, two years later, I have evidence against the minister of Harun. So I present the case against the minister. And in those days, I was thinking, okay, now would be a movement to do something. The movement was to negotiate. So what UN and African Union did was offer Bashir a negotiation to solve the conflict without mentioning justice. So Bashir took it, took it of course, and started to politically isolate so we keep investigating the case, and in December 2007, we have evidence that Bashir was personally involved. So here is a question for you. If you were the IC prosecutor, and in particular, you know now how much, what, what happened, should you present the case or not? Because 
I knew, because I was adv announcing in advance to the, some states, look, I'm going to indict President Bashir for genocide. And Mehta told me, don't do it. Don't do it. You should not do that. It's the wrong idea. No. So I knew that if I present the case, the court would be isolated. And uh, my duty was to build institution. So I was thinking, okay, that's a factor. At the same time, I had the evidence against Bashir. And I saw it's a genocide. And they told me, you should follow your evidence. So as a prosecutor, I had to keep my, my role. Of course. So I, I was thinking, okay, if I don't do a case, in three years, the same people who say me today not to do it will accept me because I did not do it. They will say, why did you did not prosecute Bashir? It was obvious I could commit the genocide. So that was normal dilemma of the prosecutor office, impossible situations. So can I make a little poll here? What's your opinion? Okay? If you are prosecutor advisors, okay? So we are in December 2007. We have the evidence against Bashir. We know no one is interested to keep pushing the case, but we have the evidence. What should I do? It's clear? So I would request yes or not. <laughs> As, raise the hand, those, those who believe the prosecutor should present the case against Bashir, please raise your hand. Okay, you need the clicker. One, two, three. I don't need a clicker. It's overwhelming. Okay. <laughs> those who, who believe I should not present the case. Come on, guys. Oh, you need the clicker. <laughs> Thank you. Just one, okay. No, two. There's one and a half. One and a half. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> you have saying, Steve. Come on. Okay. When we have clickers in the last class we had, so we ask, okay, who believes we should do it? So 43% say, yes, do it. 43% say, no, don't do it. <laughs> and I think that is more prox is normally what people think. So it's divided. And that's part of the problem, as you see. Because it's not a clear protocol, it's not a clear community for us. Whatever decision the is doing creates controversies. Yep. And then you are losing, you are, you are creating noise. You are creating a lot of noise. For me, what is amazing, and it's, it's in part confirmed by the chart of Catherine Seeking, is whatever happened, the court is still running up. The court is still moving. Whatever African Union say, uh, Central African Republic and Mali refer cases few years, a few, in a few, few months ago. So whatever, is, and, and still individuals surrender to the court. So it's like SDY, whatever people say, it's keep, it keep moving, keep, keep moving. It's like a, as you see, it's like a bastard. So the, the parents don't like him, but it keep, keep growing and keep moving and keep, and keep, keep going ahead. That is like I never thought of that. The ICC is a bastard. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Illegitimate child. The parents have to accept the reality, take responsibility. Yeah, yeah. They, they had to feed him. They had to give the money. But oh, we don't care about him. But if, if the decisions at the ICC, as controversial as they will be, are not taken, I'm talking about the prosecutor's discretion, if the decisions are not taken on the basis of the evidence, yes, we have evidence, no, we don't. If they're not taken on that, they're taken on some other basis, then the institution's all over anyway, isn't it, in terms of... I agree not, with you. Yeah, I I agree. That's why I did what I did. But, but there, I have a William Burke White, a very good professor from Pennsylvania University, saying my mistake was for trying to apply the law. I should not, because he's a lawyer, international, in the international lawyer, thinking prosecutors should do like other uh, international institutions following the will of the biggest country. That was, that's the concept. That's the theory. And in fact, Dede was thinking I was receiving traction from, from big countries. That's the problem. And, it, it, and just to tell you something on that. It's a huge problem. It's a huge gap between prosecutor thinking and lawyer thinking and diplomat thinking. It's the hugest gap in the world. When I started, I was telling my international advisor again, okay, how to start a case? How we can have consensus in starting a case? And she explained to me, in diplomatic scenarios, you do first meetings. So you talk to five or six ambassadors. As soon as they are convinced that you're right, they will support you. And then when you present your idea, they support you. And then the other hundred as did explain, they have not enough incentive to stop it, so everything is moving. That's the way to do it. And I said, but what happens if five ambassadors say no? Oh, in this case, you cannot do it. But we are prosecutors. We cannot rely on ambassadors to make decisions. 
So I say, no, we should make a decision and announce it. I say, oh, you're taking a big risk. Okay, that's the way we can do it. So my policy was announce before and then do it. And I was thinking it was a very clear policy. And I'm delighted that after I left, I'm here at Harvard, Catherine helping me to understand more what's happening. Because uh, I have always a story. I announced I would do the person who gave instructions to the minister in December 2007 and June 2008, before the Security Council. Okay? So I announced it. In July, I did it. And then in September, I met with a, a big country, one of the P5 ambassadors, and he asked me, prosecutor, how you can indict a head of state without informing us in advance? And I said, I say twice on Security Council, I will do it. And he said, yeah, yeah, you say that, you say that. But we did not believe you will do it. <laughs> I laugh in those days. I was thinking this guy is crazy, but not. In a, in a UN protocol, in a diplomat protocol, they took me as a consultation. So when you consult, you are not working before they say yes. So before they never say yes <laughs> to my idea, they were thinking I would not do it. So, and it's just a detail of how, how complex it is and how big is the gap between the way we are thinking, as you say, we have the evidence, we move, yeah. and the way they are thinking. Would you do it differently then? Would you advise them before you issue the press statement to say you're going to do it now? Or would you still do it the same way? No, but I would, I would say, it's not a consultation. I'm informing you. <laughs> I will do it. Please <laughs> understand that. That probably I would say more emphatic. Yeah. No? I would be more clear. Because I don't realize that my, my, my way to explain to them was just taking as a consultation. I had no idea that it would happen. Mm. Sure. But that's happened. So... Um, that's why when you say the challenge the challenge is that the, the ambassadors and the diplomats understand better how to integrate their own missions with the, the justice demands yeah, sure. that's for me the, the, the demand Can we open yeah let's please well, I think we should have done it 10 minutes yeah. ago but let's do it now Okay. so any comment on question of criticism or strong criticism or, or something or ideas Yes. Uh, for nothing at all, from, from what you're saying, I mean, there's a strong sense that deciding whether to indict or not is not only a legal question to consider. There's a lot of political undertones. And in, in that sense, would you consider that we should disband the whole ICC and then stick to the ICTY, ICTR format <laughs> where the political negotiations will be done in the council and then that would have already been taken care of? No, I think the idea is... I think the ICC is the idea that massive atrocities are not part of the political life. That's the idea. It's a restriction on political... So no leader can commit massive atrocities and still see, be a leader. That's the concept. And to change that, prosecutors have to be clear. Yes, I'm sorry you're a leader, but you cannot commit massive, atro massive atrocities. If not, basically what you do, you adjust to leaders who want to kill people, and then you are not helping. So the court is, is okay. The problem is, the, that's why for me the court is fine. The, the problem is the other leader has to adjust how to do it. In particular, it's complicated for the, because there are few genocide leaders in the world. There are not so many. But it's difficult to treat them. And so that is for me what the new lesson we do in bench. How, to, how the good leader can treat a bad leader. How to deal with Bashir. No? And that I think is... If the sole process was through the Security Council with the establishment of ad hoc tribunals. I reckon at least half the country situations currently under the court's jurisdiction, either as preliminary examinations or as, uh, or as uh, formal investigations, would not be, would not be no, dealt with at all. Yeah. Because they've, they've come up not by Security Council mandate, but by, um, on the basis of the territorial state being a state party and requesting the situation to be to be investigated, so um, yeah, I think I think we'd be in in a much poorer situation in terms of the coverage of the map. Um, but you know, if if in the end that's unacceptable to the international community, I guess the Assembly of States parties can say it hasn't worked. This experiment has, has not worked. We'll close it down and we'll rely solely on the Security Council. It's time. We have to finish. It's one o'clock. Yeah. So, finishing. <laughs> 
Uh, it was a pleasure to be with Tim of Macorama <laughs> here. We enjoy our life in ICC. He was, I had a great video with him and Ben Ferencz in the court. Clo- he was closing my first case and killing the defense. No, not actually killing them. No, no. <laughs> killing the arguments. I did not do that. Killing, killing the arguments. Killing well, the arguments. So, none, none of them. Killing the arguments of them. So, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with me, but remind, for me, if you are... Harvard people, you have to think, who will decide if the world is going to war on terror forever or we have a global justice system? I think Harvard people should be part of those designers. And that's why my job is to explain to you what happened, but I'm old, I, I pass. So you are the new leaders. You should invent something different to survive. Thank you very much for this conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.